we had some uh, requests of, of having another go with the corners that keep any type course um, and we can't really agree to change the topic, which is good. So we don't need any new stuff about different type programming. And the good thing about getting corners of teaching art is that you can teach the dirt about someone else's language. Okay. <laughs> On to you. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, such a, a, a large and currently interested audience. Um, let's uh, see if I can uh, maintain it. Uh, yeah, um, I guess that, so there were various discussions about the name of this thing. Uh, and, and yeah, this is really, it's more about dependent, it's like metaprogramming than it is about uh, actor. Um, but it's sort of mediated via actor. It could be uh, mediated via anything. So if you're an enthusiastic user of, uh, uh, of other dependently typed setups like uh, Coq or Idris or Haskell, then uh, feel free to um, to roll along. Actually, some of these exercises are probably easier in Camel than they are in Coq. Uh, now that Camel has uh, GADTs, uh, but uh, that's uh, uh, that's how it goes. As you can see from the the date, that this this is a a document that is uh, is in progress. Uh, it will grow over the course of uh, well, these next few days and again in the sort of second round uh, at, at the end of the month. Uh, so hopefully on the screen it will always be today's date. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm keeping a paper copy of it handy as my crib sheet. Uh, the, there's a sort of eminent danger in giving a class this way because I, I put a reasonable amount of energy into writing the notes in advance and then it's kind of completely inappropriate to just sort of stare at them in a lecture room. So I end up standing in front of you lot with lots of stuff for you to read but then what am I going to say? What am I going to do? Um, so uh, I've got to, uh, to try and maintain that in some sort of sensible order. But I think, yeah, high chaos levels to be expected. Um, is the uh, screen capture going on? Yes, it is. Uh, the, um, uh, here's the sort of prospectus, at least this is what I currently think the prospectus is. This is, of course, the source of that file. Uh, uh, no expense spared. Um, so today I basically want to do um, sort of dependently timed warm up, uh, introducing, well, so mostly kind of an actor driving lesson and some standard examples which are probably familiar uh, to quite a few of you, but nonetheless involving concepts that will be important later on. So I'm hoping to talk about vectors. Uh, which tend to be a kind of standard, under-motivated example uh, of dependently typed programming uh, that everyone's thoroughly bored with. Uh, and uh, uh, at least I have some sort of a purpose for talking about them, other than just as you know, the, the first example that everyone does. Uh, <clears throat> and the equal first example that everyone does in, uh, in a dependently typed language is to implement the simply typed lambda calculus and that's what I'll do later on today, I hope. Um, but uh, uh, all the time I'm basically looking at methods of modeling data structures, methods of modeling syntax with a view to uh, deploying them uh, later on with a purpose. Tomorrow I'm hoping to dig uh, deeper into uh, the, the fundamental structures uh, underlying dependent data types uh, so that by the end of tomorrow 
hopefully the concept of a dependent data type will be first class and in our hands. So that instead of just sort of making data type declarations, we'll have a, a, a language, a manipulable language of dependent data types that we can do interesting things with. So that's the, the mission is, you know, today to sort of get used to the concepts, tomorrow reflect it. And then uh, in a few weeks' time, I'm hoping uh, to move towards this material here, uh, uh, which is sort of geared towards uh, reflecting uh, the concepts that are found in dependent type theory, in dependent type theory. So the techniques I'm going to show you now, including modeling the simply type lambda calculus, are completely useless for modeling dependent type lambda calculus. So we're quite good at mod modeling other people's setup, simpler setups in dependent type systems, but we're not so good at modeling our own situation. Uh, so uh, I'm going to sort of talk a bit about uh, you know, how we can get slightly better at uh, chasing our own tail. And that's going to involve um, yeah, uh, more, more meta technology that's, uh, uh, that's a bit more uh, exotic. In particular, induction recursion uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, induction recursion allows you to say what something is, what, what, what things are and what they mean simultaneously. Uh, define things along with their interpretation. And that's absolutely crucial for modeling dependent types. Right. But we won't get there today. Today we will be modeling things and then looking at what they mean afterwards. Uh, so that's uh, that's the prospectus. Uh, it is, of course, uh, a movable feast. Uh, I, I'm uh, always happy to be uh, knocked off course uh, at any time. Uh, so the medium for this thing is going to be live programming. Hopefully, my uh, my RSI will permit a, a crappy big keyboard. Um, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, uh, enough chat. Uh, let's go to work. Close that file. Right. Uh, so I want to start with some kind of basic motivation and also uh, kind of actor uh, driving. Uh, I guess also getting used to um, conventions. Uh, I, I often wish when doing these sorts of live uh, things that there was a camera pointing my fingers so that you can see uh, what I'm doing and in particular how little I'm doing in order to achieve the, the things which happen. Uh, but uh, 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 that's as may be. Okay, so um, what should I say about this? So this, I'm going to start off just with the, uh, the declaration of lists, ordinary cons lists, uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the operation which tries to zip two lists together to make a list of pairs. Uh, I guess, I should uh, take some sort of audience sounding as to uh, uh, yeah, I need to figure out how fast I can go. So I guess I need people to at least be shouting speed up or slow down. Uh, I'm surprised no one's shouting speed up already. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> speed up. Uh, speed up or slow down. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Because uh, yeah, it, it, I'm wondering if everyone thinks that in this text they pretty much guessed what it means. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if 
if anyone's perplexed about anything, holler. Uh, I mean, I want so there's things to notice that, for example, well, why is it for? Why is it for? Because uh, whenever I start assigning precedence levels to operators, I start at four, <laughs> and then I try and figure out which things are bigger and smaller. Uh, sort of near the middle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, one of these days, someone is going to invent a programming language where we don't assign numbers to precedence levels, where we just write down expressions that are two layers deep and say, this means this, <laughs> and uh, writing the same thing with an extra set of parentheses. Or just writing it once, like, I don't need to see these parentheses. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know, such matters, but at the moment we're going to start with that. I, I guess I'll also point out uh, that uh, mostly as a kind of uh, post Henry Milner shock treatment, I have a nasty habit that I'm not completely consistent about of always using this symbol as a singleton constructor. That's uh, you know, a pair of angle brackets, and always using a comma as a binary constructor, especially when it's right associative. And I will use that for the unit type and pairing, I will use it for lists, <coughs> and uh, when you say, oh, but when I read a term, I can't tell what type it is, I say, the point is to tell the term what type it is. The understanding of terms with respect to types should always start with the types, not finish. And that is why I use massively overloaded constructors to get you used to projecting an understanding in terms of types onto data rather than trying to extract that understanding from the data. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sorry it's, it's a little bit brutal, but you have to learn sometime uh, for this sort of reorientation. Uh, there will be more kind of uh, post Henry Milner reorientation rants as we go along, I'm sure. Uh, uh, okay, so I just want to sort of look at. Uh, well, how is the function in Agda, and what happens uh, when we do things like uh, sort of writing zip? Uh, so the game is always to construct things interactively. You write a type down, and then you write a kind of prototype left-hand side that just gives names to uh, the arguments, and I'm actually just gonna, and then you write equals and a question mark, and then you load the file with control C, control L, and then you're in go condition. At least you should be in go condition, but the screen capture software is really killing the performance of this machine. <laughs> <laughs> and we may just, I may have to rage quit that at some point, we'll see what happens. Um, <laughs> um, it's only a little MacBook Air. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so now we're in go condition. Oh, better change the font in this window as well. Come on, how long does it take for a menu to come up? <laughs> um, font for compilation mode. Let's make that also in your own time. Spinning beach ball of death. 18 points so you can read it. Um, Okay, that, that's extremely worrying. Um, <laughs> okay, so you can see down here, sorry, down here, <laughs> uh, we get some information about goal number zero. Uh, now, uh, so then we always play, uh, well, I used to tell a joke about a certain uh, Australian television presenter and painter. Uh, who had a catchphrase, uh, can you tell what it is yet? Um, but 
He's fallen on troubled times, so we'll <laughs> try and find him. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the game is always, can you tell what it is yet? And if you can't tell what it is yet, you need to get some more information. So you think, what do I need to look at in order to figure out what it is? Um, so we're going to need to look at one or other of these lists, probably both of them in the end, to figure out what it is. And the way you look at it is to type its name, and then wait for two characters to appear, <laughs> and then hit Control C, Control C. And then after a brief bit of uh, yeah, cogitation, you discover that in accordance with the declaration of the data type, uh, you get the possible patterns. Okay. And then we can play the same game again with T's. Um, and we get uh, a spinning <laughs> <It's really laughs> I think I might. We're not going to make it. Kill that yeah, I'm going to kill that screen capture. We, we can figure out how to improve things later. Um, stop. <laughs> I can zoom in on the screen from the camera. <laughs> Right. Sorry, posterity. I will say this much. Um, okay. Hopefully, we'll get a bit more. <laughs> yes, it's more responsive already. Yeah. Okay. So we fill in nil, and that's Control C, Control Space to uh, to give the value in. If I split. Uh, T's here, then I'll discover that I don't like the names it's chosen, so I'll rename them and load the file. And then I'll say the answer is to pair up S and T, and then to zip S's and T's. And if I load the file again, just to recheck the results of the interactive process, it gets uh, coloured in. You may notice that the colours I have are different uh, from the colours that you have in Acta. And if you look inside the Emacs mode customization settings, you will find that there's a way to switch on my colour schemes instead of the Acta standard colour schemes, which they put in very kindly just to stop me getting confused. Um, and, yeah, but anyway. Never mind the colour. Uh, what we have here are the two, uh, the two goals corresponding to the lengths of the lists not matching. And you can decide what to do under these circumstances. Um, most people uh, fill, fill in like a dummy value. Well, here, I mean, this has to be nil. There's nothing else you can give. And then you've got uh, a function which will produce spurious output if you feed it spurious input. And if you use it as a software component, you will not notice you've done anything silly if, you're, if you fail to maintain your invariants. In fact, uh, some experienced programmers I know working in in Haskell, say, do recommend actually throwing an exception, preferably a fatal one, in these two cases, just so that at least if you've screwed up, you notice. Um, uh, uh, and this, this issue, this sort of use of dummy values causing problems, uh, it affects uh, you know, real systems. In fact, I once diagnosed a uh, uh, an error uh, due to this very problem in a computer program called Agda. <laughs> uh, and this is always what, what happens actually when you're implementing these programming languages. You get terrible feature envy for the language you're implementing. <laughs> you wish you could already do that stuff. <laughs> yeah, so that's a bug in Agda that would have been caught if. Um, we were able to 
uh, manage invariance. So, okay, so we've got this idea that maybe we can do better at managing the length of variance. Um, so, let me uh, try this much. Okay, so here's something I prepared earlier. It's the definition of the natural numbers and the length function that uh, measures lists. And then, and is there an easy way of, of finding out what built-ins you're allowed to act at? Um, no. So. Okay. Uh, I recommend grepping the standard library for the token <laughs> built-in. <laughs> because they use it all for that. Um, I'm sure it's driven by that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, okay. So one way, a kind of good old way of addressing this uh, sort of a puzzle is to think: well, you know, invariants are the business of a layer of logic that we put on top of our programs. So we're going to keep the same bits and pieces lying around, here are our lists, uh, but uh, we're going to sort of chuck some other stuff in here, um, uh, which involves sort of logical information. So this double equal sign is the type of evidence that its two arguments are equal. So I'm saying, oh, well, what if we get two lists and we know they're the same length? then can we deliver, well we better not just deliver any old output list, we should at least also produce an output list that's the same length as the inputs. So here I'm writing this as a sigma type, a type of dependent pairs. So the first thing, this is the type of the first component, and then I use this backslash, that's a lambda, Binding a variable that stands for the value of the first component so that I can give the type of the second component depending on that value. Is everyone cool with that? So what I'm saying is you not only give me an output list, you give me a proof that its length is the same as, and here I kind of made an, an arbitrary choice of which of the lists uh, I was going to say it was the same length as. Um, okay, so now if we uh, if we try writing this program interactively, we get a little bit further. Let's get cracking. Control C, Control C, and now when I do T's, Control C, Control C, I still get the same cases. But here, okay, here we win. Uh, and it's asking me, so if I do control C, control comma, I get to look at the status of the goal. We would like to know the zero, yep? Can you explicitly say what you're typing, if it's not too much? Yeah, I can try to, yes. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, first of all, a case split on S's, and then a case split on T. So I type the identifier, and then control C, control C. And then here I did control C, control comma to inspect this goal in particular. And it tells me what the goal is and what information I have. Sorry, well, I'm not doing screen capture anymore, so I won't point to the screen. Uh, uh, okay, and um, uh, can I prove that zero equals zero? Yes, I can. The name of the proof that something equals itself is REFL for reflexivity. Okay, now let's look at this troublesome case. I have, amongst my assumptions, the extraordinary, extraordinarily useful piece of information that zero is equal to a successor. That's to say, the length invariant has been violated. So I get to do one of the best things. I get to say, well, 
There's Q, and how could it possibly have been constructed? That's to say, control C, control C. That's what that means. How could this possibly have been constructed? So that Q, how could it possibly have been constructed? And the answer is, it could not. <laughs> so sometimes, lines of our programs don't have a right-hand side. Instead, they have this symbol, the absurd pattern, which I sometimes refer to as my Aunt Fanny. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a t traditional, traditional thing to say after a statement one knows is false. So, zero equals successor, my aunt funny! <laughs> um, so you're indicating which piece of the input is utter nonsense. And then we don't have to say what to do, because we could never have got into that situation. So that progress, one off diagonal case, has been defeated. And I can do the same with the other one. And I'll do my renaming here. And then we can see where we are. OK, so now we have to deliver some output. I'm going to do another move uh, with the fingers. Um, there's a, movement called, a move called refine. That just means, is there one constructor that goes here? And that's control C, control R. And certainly there is. I'm supposed to produce a pair. So I can certainly stick a comma in to produce two holes. And I'm supposed to produce a list of things. Um, uh, so now I'm going to use uh, a next uh, magic feature, uh, which is uh, control C, control A, which invokes a kind of search mechanism called Axi. It says, like, well, hopefully the type is enough to determine the thing that goes here. So see if you can just find something that will, will go here and stick it in for me. And it says, well, you know, the empty list is a list. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, beware of that particular uh, uh, functionality. Sometimes the answer is underspecified. Um, I could try and just... That's partly because I was only trying to figure out one component without looking at the other component that actually is the specific or more of the specification. I can say, how about the whole thing? How about it? Too stupid to figure that one out. So uh, we're not getting that much help from the automatic here. OK, so let's just write the answer that we wanted. And of course, we have to fill in the proof of something. What have I done wrong? Uh, oh, that. Uh, oh, and that thing produces the proof. Sorry. So um, I'll show you this. This is a good little exercise to remind me the things I ought to tell you. I just did Control C, Control X, Control D. That's the deactivate um, option, which just gives me plain text. Because uh, what I want to do is show you the width feature. The width allows you to say, get hold of some information and add it to the collection of things on the left hand side that I can do pattern matching on. One of the things you notice in pattern matching languages uh, that once you decide you want to compute something from your pattern variables that you need, that's useful information, you have to commit to working on the right-hand side of your program. You don't get to say, oh, I can also use this information, but let me stay on the left-hand side and do some more matching. That's what the with feature allows you to do, and it's particularly useful in dependently typed programming. So here, we're going to get back st and we're going to get some proof Q prime. Okay, so let's see. Um, we now have two goals. Well, now I can fill in ST uh, and STs. That's going to be 
the answer, and then I'll have to do a proof about it. Couldn't parse that. Why couldn't you parse that? Never mind. Um, um, well, actually, that's the right thing to do anyway. Um, okay, so what are our outstanding goals? We must, in order to make the recursive call, we are obliged to show that the lists we are zipping are the same length. Uh, so uh, we have to discharge this proof obligation given this information, which ought to be possible. <laughs> and then when we're finishing up, we know that the length of this, we have to show that the length of the thing we're giving back is equal to the successor of the length of the tail. We've got sort of a chain of, of reasoning to do here as well. Again, that's a dischargeable proof obligation. But it's just a bit fiddly to do some work. So the point of this exercise is simply to say, isn't it annoying to do that kind of theorem proving when you're just trying to write a program that manages a length? I'm not going to discharge these proof obligations. I'm just going to observe how irritating they are. Uh, um, instead, uh, I'm going to comment out this interesting exploration and wheeling the vectors. Um, uh, I don't know why that comma's got a green background. <laughs> Rebuilding a file. <laughs> Still got a green background. What's going on? <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so the vectors, or lists indexed by their length, are a family of types indexed by natural numbers uh, where uh, the natural number tells you uh, the, uh, the length uh, of the list. And why is length of the list interesting? Because that describes the shape of the list. We want the reason. What makes zipping work is that the shapes match. So there's a sensible notion of corresponding position. And we needed, that was the thing that we needed to ensure coincidences of when we were setting up the business of zipping. So that's the thing we should make explicit in the type in order to be able to talk about the invariants more easily. So we can see nil makes length, a list of length zero, and the uh, cons makes a list of length one more than the length of its tail. I should possibly say something about this thing here. You can see I am saying that vec of x has type nat arrow set. And you might wonder why am I not saying vec is in set arrow nat arrow set? Or why am I not saying vec of x in set and n in nat is of type set? Uh, and so let me point out the uh, crucial left of the colon, right of the colon distinction in data type declarations. It is often misdescribed in documentation. Uh, so I will, in due course, point out the examples which tell the right story. The point is this. If you want to give constructor declarations which instantiate uh, a, an index of the type. So here we want to say, specifically, nil only makes things of length zero. Specifically, cons uh, makes things only of successor length. Then you must abstract that index right of the colon. So the things that are quantified over right of the colon are the specializable indices. The things that are left of the colon 
must be uniform in the return types of the constructors. As it happens, this one is uniform in every usage of the type constructor in the whole of the declaration. And because it is uniform both in the return types of the constructors and in recursive positions, we could abstract it out as a parameter of the whole thing. So it is fair to call x a parameter of this declaration. You can imagine this declaration would make perfect sense if we instantiated x with something in particular. Because it's completely uniform in x. Some act of documentation says that the things left of the colon are parameters. Uh, and whilst it is the case that all parameters should be declared left of the colon, it is not the case that everything declared left of the colon is a parameter. And we'll see examples of that later. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a thing uh, to be careful about. But what's going on here is that we're, the things that are right of the colon are things that we are allowed to specialise. And that's special Andy. So, uh, what, what if I'm, I kind of didn't know any of this? And kind of foolishly put my, my x to the right of the colon, would that hit me later in the back side? Um, well, let's... It wouldn't be wrong, exactly. Uh, let us explore that very prospect this very minute. So, the first thing that goes wrong is that because it's not left with the colon, it doesn't scope over the rest of the thing. Yeah. Okay, cool, fine, no problem. We can... Just stick it in there. And now we get hit with another problem. Now it looks like our constructors are actually packing up individual x's, individual sets. And we're saying this whole thing is a set, but inside it stores sets. So we're making you know, a set of all sets kind of construction, so we, this would force us to make vectors bigger. So you get bitten pretty quickly yeah. with large parameters when you do that. With small parameters, it genuinely doesn't matter, except that you get multiple copies of things you don't need. So if I was really often, I could make set, set one. Yes, and then it would work. Let's not do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, that's a crucial point actually. There is no size restriction on parameters. In fact, there are no size restrictions on indices either. Uh, and no one knows whether that makes sense. The only rules about sizes are well, so the stuff that's actually packed up inside a constructor when you uh, deploy it is the stuff that's listed here. You don't need an X because that's coming from the type. So we're storing these things, and these things are all small, so that's fine. Um, so the restrictions, so the point is that when you move this thing to the right hand side of the colon, then you need to start talking about it inside the constructor contents and then you get a size restriction. So it's a subtle point. I, I genuinely don't know whether uh, the rule that says you are allowed large indices in places like this, um, as long as you don't quantify over large things inside the uh, constructors, whether that's okay. Um, that's, uh, people seem to be kind of casual about it. Uh, and they, they then reference uh, a, a message from me on the active mailing list where I said one might imagine it's okay because no large things are being contained inside the constructors but I don't really know and they said this is why everyone thinks it's okay so it's my fault <laughs> uh, I was trying to say I don't know if this is okay <laughs> but uh, that went wrong okay anyway back where we were we now get to say oh look the inputs and the output have to all be the same length. 
at some length a. Um, and uh, yeah, so what happens now? Well, let's just sort of pay a little bit of attention. We say, what's the score? We know that we've got um, uh, two vectors and they're both of length n. Uh, and the return type has been expanded for us as the non-dependent special case of a dependent pair type that we saw earlier. Is, is there any way of stopping it, Dave? Uh, oh, yes, let's do control C dot. Oh, no, it's not control C, control dot. Oh, that's something else. What is it? Is there, there's a way of making it do the thing without normalizing. Well, I think it's control C, control dot. It doesn't seem to make any difference when I do it. Right, but it asks me for expression to type, which that's the wrong thing. So I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, so this is, it's, it's normalizing everything in sight, which is sometimes not what you want. I want to point out that identifiers beginning with dot are uh, things which Agda has names for, but you don't. You can see all that is actually in scope for you are the pattern variables bound on the left hand side of the program. These other things must exist, but you can't talk about them at the moment. There are ways to bring these things into scope if you need to talk about them. But still, Agda needs to talk about them in order to tell you the types of things. So that's the convention. Dot on the front means you can't talk about this, but I can. You can control U before the command. No, 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 I think. What was that? So control U before the command. So control U, control C, control command. Ah, very good. Yes, so that's. <laughs> How memorable is that? Okay, uh, and then of course it says, 
I'm going to print out something I can't parse. <laughs> so you insert the extra set of parentheses necessary, and then you win. <laughs> um, but wh why does it print out something it can't parse? Uh, this is definitely a bug in the pretty printer rather than in Axie. I've seen that show up in displays of um, lists in a go. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a, somebody's not managing um, associativity correctly in the pretty printer, which is unfortunate. Um, so yes, something to be aware of. Um, okay. Um, more fun and games. I wonder how much of this I want to leave for you. I definitely want to leave zip2 for you. Um, I'll do these two though. But I'll do them rapidly. Um, so, uh, here are a couple of useful uh, vector gadgets just to get uh, used to things. Uh, and they'll show up time and time again. Uh, the first one just says, if you've got a, an element and you want to make a vector of copies of that element, how do you do it? Uh, I ask him those, why is there no specification if, for this function uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the exercises? Because there's only one option. Yeah, <laughs> because it's parametric. Um, it's also an interesting um, point about um, uh, Hindley Milner culture. There's only one move you can make, by the way, at that point, because x is of some unknown type. Uh, so the only thing we can look at is the, uh, uh, is the length. And then. Does Axing know the answer yes? Does Axing know the answer yes? Um, no, you'll notice that uh, I'm on the left hand side, I'm being explicit about the length, and use, I'm writing the argument in braces, and that's how you do a manual override for the usual, for things which are usually implicit. So the braces in the type mark a preference for these arguments to be suppressed and figured out by unification at usage sites. However, any time you want to make them explicit, you can always do so by writing them in braces. And that's what's happening here. And I need to make it explicit because at these definition sites, I actually need to look at this information to figure out what to do. Meanwhile, here, at this usage site, the type is obviously going to be a vector of length n, so that's going to determine the implicit n argument. So we don't need to write it. It does need to be structurally smaller than successor of n, nonetheless, and it is, thank goodness, but it can still be invisible and structurally smaller than successor of n. Um, so this is a sort of another difference with uh, with Hindley Milner culture. I mean, uh, Milner achieved this incredible coincidence of coincidences, uh, where the things that are the sort of visible invisible distinction corresponds to the type term distinction, corresponds to the present at runtime, absence at runtime distinction. All of these things line up. And one thing that we have sort of culturally fallen into is not even realizing that these are distinct distinctions and can be moved out of alignment. And this is one case where they're being moved out of alignment, where an invisible thing is not a type but a value, and moreover, it is present at runtime and computationally critical. You know, it's not parametric. It nonetheless is seldom written 
at use of cells. So that's just a thing that we're we, we get used to these things, these sort of instincts, and we don't even know that, uh, that, that they are there to be suppressed, and then dependently type programming takes us by surprise. Presumably, if you um, I mean, you can, you can overindulge yourself in implicit argument, presumably, and get screwed at some point. Absolutely. Rod Burstall used to say plus Kant invariance arguments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, the answer is four. What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, things do sometimes tend to be a bit of, you know, mm, there's some sort of high road unification going on here that I don't really understand. Let's just gradually make things implicit while it can still guess what they are. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and you, yeah, that's the point. It, it, it's not any old high road unification that's going on. It's um, quite a sensible kind of um, higher order, a sensible fragment of higher order unification called uh, pattern unification that uh, notably Dale Miller wrote good things about. It. So that that's the thing which is to the way ActiWorks as Robinson's first order unification is to the way algorithm W works. So it's a sort of good thing to, to dig out and get some intuition about uh, at some point. I'm going to write this thing and uh, at top speed. I've got a fit. So instead of this is a zip like thing, um, except that I've got a vector of functions and a vector of arguments, and I'm applying the things in you know, functions to the arguments in, in corresponding positions. And I'm just going to do an alpha at this point because I don't like names it should. Um, okay, um, I'll leave, right, so the exercise for you, oh, I didn't re replace my opening comment, uh, is to, um, uh, is to figure out how to use um, VEC and VAP to implement ZIP without any recursion, just as a one line. Uh, while you're at it, do MAP. Uh, while you're at it, uh, uh, ZIP three things. Uh, or implement the function that adds two vectors of natural numbers component wise. Uh, all of those sorts of things. So essentially, doing uh, vectorized programming, kind of single instruction, multiple data programming uh, on uh, elements in corresponding positions of vectors. These are the two pieces of equipment uh, that, uh, that let you do that. And it's one of those things I could try and rush into the next thing, or we could take the break a bit earlier. You might be better taking a break there. Yeah. So right. Yeah, we should we should start again. That's the thing. <laughs> the <laughs> coffee uh, is here. Coffee oh, is here. Yes. yes. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah, I yeah. is. Okay. So twenty minute break, and yeah. then we continue. Right.